This is Ben Gillespie interviewing Carrie Moyer at her studio in Brooklyn. It's August 20th, 2020, and this is the Smithsonian Institution Archives of American Art Pandemic Project. Carrie, could you tell me about how your life and work have changed since March of this year? Oh my God, um, it's kind of amazing. Um, well, as the director of a grad program at Hunter College for the for the in the MFA area, um, the immediate effect of March 13th was total chaos, rambling. Um, uh, you know, I have a hundred or we have 125 students in the program, so it's very large, and the loss of studio space was, um, it, I mean, it was very like closely felt. Luckily for my, my studio is in the Brooklyn Army Terminal and the, the city which owns this site was like, well, you can't come um, until, we, until the quarantine is raised in, in town, but we would sneak in here anyway. So, but the students were not able to do that. So, I mean, I think everything is just, um, you know, it's been this weird uh, situation of like the, the, the intertwining of boredom and anxiety. It's sort of profound. And I always think of myself as a, even though I deal with a huge student population and many faculty colleagues as a kind of a loner, it's like, oh my God, I'm really, uh, I really do look to those social interactions with my friends, you know? So it's been very intense. And my wife, who is the artist Sheila Pepe, had COVID in April. So that was super frightening. So, yeah. <laughs> um, should I just keep talking or? If you want, I mean, I'd love to, so, what was that like in April? What was it like to, to care for yourself and to care for your wife? It was, you know, I, the, the thing, I, I was born in Michigan and I have a real sort of Midwestern, even though I grew up on the West Coast and primarily in Oregon, I have this real Midwestern like, okay, it's an emergency. I'm going to like put on my big girl pants and just shut everything out. So that was what happened when Sheila was sick, and um, it, it's sort of been in the over the summer now that she's recuperating, and it takes a really long time that I'm kind of um, absorbing the fact that she was so incredibly sick. But at the same time, in April in New York, the hospitals were completely overwhelmed, so she was not sick enough to be taken to the hospital. Um, so I basically cared for her, you know, like really intensely for a couple of weeks and then more um, not so uh, hovering, <laughs> shall I say, more or less and after that. But um, it was, it was very scary, actually. It's scary just because we don't know so much about it and um, she only had one or two of the symptoms that was on the sort of CDC list of symptoms so and then I turned out it turned out I was tested and I had it and it was completely asymptomatic so the 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 difference all of that stuff trying to figure it out not being doctors um, etc Well, I mean, following from that episode, have there been any changes in your own work and your own artistic practice during this time? Um, it was interesting because Sheila and I had um, spent the year preparing to do a collaborative show up in Portland, Maine, actually, at the Portland Museum of Art called Tabernacles for Trying Times. And we'd spent, I, I mean, first of all, it was this amazing invitation that, um, you know, many artists are partnered with other artists, but it's so rare to be able 
to be given a chance to show together. And we have had this sort of sideline where we've collaborated on things over the years, starting at a residency at Yado about in 2011, I think it was. Um, so we had conceived of this show as this sort of space for the community to negotiate difference. Like we literally made this um, centerpiece in which, you know, Sheila designed these chairs and we designed a kind of uh, tent form. And there was gonna be all this programming around um, immigrant rights, racial justice, all sorts of things, lesbian issues, uh, feminist and within you know maybe three weeks of the show being open it was closed so there was this real poignancy to um the fact that we had spent all this time thinking about how a museum could function as a place to bring people together and then the fact that all of the programming had to go online and um I still think, although the show is moving to the Museum of Art and Design in January of 2021, it still feels like it was, it's, it's going to be a much smaller show. Um, but the, the sort of the, uh, sadness and irony of the whole situation kind of blows my mind. Um, and then after, so that opened in February and then I was supposed to come back and get ready for a solo show and get ready for a freeze art fair, um, a solo booth there, which it ended up that freeze actually happened. So I had to like sneak to my studio and paint during the pandemic, which was interesting and, um, it was kind of a relief actually, because it was like, it felt like even though the art fair had gone online, it felt like um, there was some normalcy in a way. Because so much of, um, I think in the first couple months, there was so much fear and just really sort of the unknown factors around how this would impact you know, like my students, 60% of my students are unemployed right now, which is incredibly frightening. Um, luckily, we were able to raise money to help them with tuition this year. So, um, but the whole landscape, you know, from the, the New York real estate to, um, you know, how a college would function to how the art market would function. You know, all of these sort of structures that are so important to being part of this organism that's the city are altered and impacted by this thing. And it's, you know, it's like, almost like you don't want to think about it too hard because it, uh, it, it feels like a bottomless pit. So, and then, you know, all the, um, I think in the beginning, I was like, oh, good, it'll go back to being like it was in the 70s. I never lived here in the 70s. I moved to New York in 1980, so, and it was still pretty scary and just, you know, um, I was going to say destitute, but uh, decrepit is the better word. Um, and in a weird way, I would never want to go back to that. But um, I guess I was trying to find some kind of silver lining around the economy and how it's sort of, you know, affected artists in terms of, um, you know, the reason that our New York was this um, bastion of uh, abandoned industrial loss was because it was failing economically. The minute it starts to do well, we are all squeezed for studio space. So it's this interesting conundrum and everything's connected. Um, but I'm, I'm going on and on. 
<laughs> it's, it's great. I mean, I was, so I was thinking of a, a couple points where you were just talking about the, the interconnection and being in New York where everything feels so interdependent and, you know, the proximity just makes you really aware of the presence of others. Um, but we're also in a moment of profound isolation. Yeah. Um, but we're seeing some of the, the power of that interconnectedness through, through uprisings and social justice movements. And I guess I was wondering, um, thinking about your amazing Tabernacle show, are there things now, like how would it change in light of what's happened over the course of 2020? I mean, I think that, um, you know, the, the, up, the Black Lives Matter movement and the uprisings and the, um, you know, days of marches and protests have been um, both amazing and really surprising to me, I think, because a lot of the issues that are being brought up about parity, about racial diversity, about um, equity across all, extended to all marginalized people, including women and queer people and whatever, um, are things that have been um, part of my way of being like as a faculty member it's been something i work with my colleagues on on getting more students of color and but at the same time the sort of urgency that was is coming from the generation of my students primarily um made me really aware of how how institutions move so slowly and how little i mean we can do a little bit inside of an institution and i think as somebody who's a very active as a young artist or even into my 30s um i think the goal in my mind was like okay i need to get inside an institution and see if i can change it from there but now I look at the things that we've tried to do and I feel they seem very inadequate at this moment because there's such a um, outpouring of emotion and, um, you know, everything feels like it's like there's no stone left unturned. We're, we're looking at everything from museums to colleges to libraries to um, everything uh, how our social um how we relate to each other what we can expect of each other how soon things need to happen and then part of me because i'm now 60 years old it's like well those things are feelings but they're not facts it's like a lot of the stuff that feels so urgent is um if it happens at all, it's going to take a much longer timeline. You know what I mean? So, so part of me is like, yes, this is this amazing kickstart that shows how inadequate the last, um, you know, I guess 70 year, if I start, start from like the sixties, um, sort of left movements, have, it shows how inadequate the, the changes have been or, or the, the distance we need to go, but at the same time, um, just being inside a very slow moving behemoth like Hunter College is just like, oh my God. <laughs> you know, those two things side up against each other are very intense. Wonderful. Well, as someone now who is in a, in a stable position and a sometimes sedentary institution, what advice would you give to your younger activist self? Um, I think, uh, I mean, this is such a cliche, but I'm finding it in my, my as I get older, it's like I've become much more, um, 
um, I've become less less exacting about how people um, about what people are capable of. Like, uh, I feel like right now we're in, and, and I get it. I get the level of anger and the level of, um, um, I mean, I think if I were in my 20s or early 30s right now, I would just be like out of my mind because there's so many aspects of our culture right now that are in serious disrepair and, um, things that we have been taught to believe in and I'll, I mean like everything is suspect at this moment but I also feel like having these really rigid um, uh, bars that must be met for types of sort of ethical purity and stuff is not gonna and I uh, participated in that as a younger activist you know it's like this isn't good enough. I mean, I think we're going into an election right now where it's uh, it's going to be on white people to vote for Biden, whether they don't like like him or not, because they are um, how do I say this? It's like if they don't if they don't help the Democrats get in basically it's four more years of subjecting people of color to incredible racism so you know i just it's like again this is this kind of purity situation it's like i don't he's not my candidate um but anyway so all of this stuff is happening you know between the post office and the uh, yeah <laughs> um Speak to me, Ben. <laughs> um, well, I guess so by means of wrapping up, um, I was wondering what sort of what message would you want to convey for students and artists in the future, say 50 years from now, um, in reflecting on 2020 and making it through so far, <laughs> knock on wood for the rest of it. Um, uh. What would you, what feels urgent or compelling um, to say in the snapshot? I mean, I think that, um, uh, you know, we're not in this moment uh, when we haven't been for a long time where the avant-garde, you know, even that term is kind of a relic, but there was a, you know, in the 20th century, I was born in 1960, the avant-garde had a politic, you know, it was, so these two, like the avant-garde and the word radical might go together. Um, do we think that artists are these change agents in the way that like, um, uh, you know, Malevich or people in the Russian um, constructivist movement did, or even, um, you know, like the futurists who were much more conservative, in fact, um, is it, I, I guess my, the point that I'm trying to make is like, um, and this is something that most artists are going to recognize. It's like one of the things that is, and has been sort of critical to art school is the fact that even if one doesn't become an artist, ultimately it becomes a tool for learning how to think, um, in a kind of dialogic and critical way about how things are functioning. And I feel like instead of um, sort of burying ourselves, even though this is the impulse and we're being told to stay home, um, it feels really even more necessary to sort of expose ourselves to things and information and um, Par participate in the best possible way we can and not just by making a painting like painting is one one aspect of it but being like a full citizen is um just feels really critical right now 
So, you know, I, you know, my personal instinct is I want to just stay in my studio and make paintings, but it's like, and part of that is important, but it's also really, really essential to stay involved with the communities, be aware of what's going on, be, you know, participate in it. So that's my message for the day. <laughs> I think that's wonderful. Yeah, you know, we've got to, despite being quarantined and learning to take care of one another from a distance, um, we've still got to stay connected and find new ways of maintaining and building those connections to keep this all grounded and together. So thank you very much for speaking with me today. Thank you, Ben.